I am uh, Kim Edwards and I'm with the Center for Excellence in Education. And we were founded in 1983 by Turan DiGennaro and Admiral Rick Ober, father of nu nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power. We have a mission to nurture high school and university scholars of careers, two careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. We offer three cost free programs to teachers and students in the United States, which are the Research Science Institute, uh, the USA Bioolympiad, and the Teacher Enrichment Program. Today, I am super thrilled to have Dr. Jacob Temme, who is an aerospace engineer at DEVCOM Army Research Lab, and who has also um, attended our RSI program in 2002 and came back as a counselor for that program in 2004. Additionally, uh, we have uh, Dr. Zoe Landsman, chief scientist of um, at Exolith Lab at the University of Central Florida. And lastly, uh, Dr. James Navidi, uh, associate professor at the Department of Aerospace Engineering um, with the University of Colorado at Boulder. And with that, Dr. Temme, you can take it away. So as mentioned, uh, I'm Dr. Jacob Temme and be talking just quickly a little bit about some of the recent uh, news and outcomes, as mentioned with the telescope, but also a number of uh, really great successes this year in civilian space travel. I currently work uh, after RSI, I continued my research in aerospace engineering. My focus has been on combustion uh, and propulsion technologies. Currently work down here at uh, DEVCOM Army Research Lab, helping to lead a program looking at what do we do in the future for power and energy, particularly for uh, robots and ground systems, flying systems. How do those team and pair everything from biofuels? What is the right amount of hybrid electric for which kind of robot? How big it is? What is it going to be doing its tasks? Teams of robots, right? If you need uh, something accomplished, how do they work together as a team and share energy amongst themselves and make uh, autonomous decisions about which robot should do which task. Um, so those are kind of the, the research areas we're leading. Today I was going to just uh, say a few words on, on kind of space travel specifically. So if you've been watching the news, you probably caught at least a couple of these things, but there's been a lot going on, right? We've had multiple companies been able to successfully launch reusable rockets, uh, taking people up into space. A, a flurry of those across the, the late summer into the early fall. We've had, uh, the first all civilian space flight, right? Actually orbiting, um, not just launching up to the edge of space and coming back down, but uh, orbiting was in September. A couple other milestones, right? This was a recent launch where they've used the same rocket stage, what they say five or nine times or something. So reusable this, this idea of being able to really start cutting down costs and make this more accessible to science, to technology, to development. So in some ways we've solved the hard part, but it's also more the easy part. And what do I mean by that, right? The, the difficulty of getting to space is really how fast you have to go to stay in orbit. And so much of this is just accelerating your spacecraft up to that velocity. So some different numbers, right? Um, getting off the surface of the Earth, you're looking about eight kilometers a second. And fortunately, once you're up there, it's easier to go other places, right? So getting over to the moon, uh, you know, four to six, um, getting over to some of these asteroids that we're interested in, maybe about four. So the hard part was getting up there in the first place. But at the same time, I call that the easy part um, because what we're doing on a lot of these rockets is kind of just updating and uh, modernizing the designs and technologies that we had in the, the Apollo space program and working on making that a reusable platform. So there are a lot of uh, very interesting engineering technology challenges for that. But at a certain level, we're kind of stuck in this tyranny of the rocket equation problem, right? So if I want to send a pound of mass to space, um, I'm generally going to need just a bit under a pound of fuel. And then that pound of fuel needs just a little, or just under a pound of fuel needs just under, just under a pound of more fuel to get it going. So you end up with these structures where, you know, your 85% fuel mass and another 10 to 12% structure to hold that fuel. And you're only putting three, you know, one to 3% of your um, vehicle is actually what you wanted to take to space in the first place. So these are all kind of the challenges of, of how we do space travel. And like I said, we've, we've solved one of the hardest parts, which was escaping Earth's gravity well. But there's a lot of, of other challenges now that, that you know, you solved one problem, you, you're rewarded with two new ones. And so kind of looking out um, at what some of those things are, uh, this is a, a chart that NASA put out recently to kind of help um, researchers and civilian and everyone make estimates about, you know, how do we keep people alive on these missions? So everything from the air, how they'll live, how they'll eat, how they'll get water, how we keep them uh, uh, conditioned to be the right temperature, right? The parts of space where it's very hot and the parts of space where it's very cold. And right now, 
basically all these missions that we've been doing and all these recent successes we had this year and in the last five years are these what we're calling very short missions. And when you think about that, because you're just going up and back and you know, you're know you not up there for more than maybe a day, you don't have to have a lot of these concerns. You can just bring all your trash home. You can use a lot of disposable things. But when we start branching out to where uh, we want to go in civilian space travel, you know, we're talking about things like, let's go up to the moon. You know, even if that's tourism or if that's long term to deploy into a habitat, you know, that's basically an eight day, you know, a seven day trip there and back, you know, about a day in, on the moon. So you're in this kind of second bar. Or if we're up there currently on the um, ISS, right, you tend to be on the order of this, this pink box here. Uh, we start talking about things like going out to um, Mars or out to somewhere where you're trying to mine a specific surface um, or some of the other applications. We're into this long term. We're into things that are uh, very reusable, uh, growing food, not just bringing it with you. How do we make sure that we try and recover every ounce of water possible? Um, don't waste anything. And so kind of depending on, you know, we've we were able to focus a lot in the civilian space here in these missions because you didn't have a lot of those concerns. And so we solved that and now now we get to come on to the fun problems, right? Um, how do we do power and energy? How do we do water? How do we do waste? And so some of those ongoing challenges, right, uh, that are always going to be there in space. It's the ultimate austere or extreme habitat, right? When we design things in the civilian space here on Earth, you know, most of your electronics, you get to go home and you get to plug them into an outlet. Uh, there are no outlets up there, right? If uh, I dropped my kids off at school today and they forgot their coats while well, we just ran home, you know, you know, turn the car around, go get your coat, put it back uh, with them. But if you forget your coat on the spacecraft, um, that's it. You're up there. You're not coming back, right? So uh, there's also no, uh, there's not a gas station, right? We've talked about there's uh, concepts for how do we build a gas station up on the moon or something along the way to make this easier. How do we take when we built the ISS, right? They sent up multiple launches with multiple components that all got assembled up there. We didn't launch it all at the same time. Which leads to kind of the one of the other greater challenges of space is how do you do manufacturing? How do we build things? Um, how do we build not just spare parts, but fuel, food, other things? Uh, a lot of our industrial processes, when you think about it, rely on gravity. When you go to weld one of these um, fuel tanks together, Right, getting that weld to go to the place you intend and to stick there while it solidifies is reliant on a gravity. So how do we have to redesign our manufacturing process to go up into um, outer space? How do we do, you know, actually fully self-enclosed self-sufficiency? And I think one of our speakers today will be talking about that, but I remember as a child uh, uh, hearing about Biosphere 2, right? The great experiment that they were gonna lock themselves in this uh, environment and be fully self-sufficient and all the, um, the challenges they had and, and weren't able to realize at that time in the, in the early 90s and where we've come since then. Also a couple uh, pitches here. So we talk about, right, this asteroid that just came, this was on Saturday, right? The asteroid came into its nearest orbit to Earth. Uh, and so it didn't hit us, but like they're talking about, that was a um, some significant amounts of cobalt, of nickel, some of these precious metals that are very rare on Earth that we could go up there and possibly um, get, right? Cobalt is in significant demand for all of the electric vehicle um, batteries that we want to, if we want to transition uh, to an electric uh, vehicle fleet, we're going to need a lot more cobalt. Also, uh, DARPA, right? They just announced right before Thanksgiving, so probably got lost in a lot of announcements, but um, biomanufacturing for space, right? Can we send a pod up somewhere that has bacteria that are designed to grow different things, not just food sources or biofuels the way we think of, but um, can they start growing where their uh, waste product is building blocks for structures? And also, I'll put a little pitch in there, right, with some of our area. Where, should, where does autonomy play in this, right? Um, we send rovers up right now to Mars, and they do limited scientific tasks. And part of that is, is a communications problem, right? I don't have an astronaut next to them that can help fix things or, or retask them. Um, but part of it's also a, a limitation in the, the ability of autonomy right now. Um, so if we envision this future, likely these astronauts will have um, some robotic partner. So how do we do human agent uh, teaming and, and those kind of functions in space? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tammy. And if we were all in person, we'd clap. 
um, but we're not. So it's, you know, it's this instead. Um, and with that, uh, we can take it to Dr. Landsman. I'm, I'm Dr. Zoe Landsman. I uh, work at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. Uh, at the Exolith Lab, and today I'm going to talk to you about the work we do there, which is uh, working with uh, essentially fake space dirt. So I'll tell you about uh, why and how and how fake space dirt is useful in um, uh, preparing to have an, a long-term human presence uh, in space. So just a quick bit about my background. So I uh, got my bachelor's in physics, in 2011, I worked, uh, I actually was, a, I was an English major, so I was not a person who always knew I wanted to be a scientist. <laughs> uh, so that bachelor's degree took a little longer than normal. Um, and then I worked for a while as a programmer, computer programmer, and then uh, went back to school to get uh, my PhD. And my uh, field of study is planetary science. So that's the scientific field that uh, covers the study, the science, scientific study of the solar system and other planetary systems. It's a very broad field, so that could be anything from studying moons to planets to atmospheres of planets to comets and asteroids and rings around planets and even how uh, planetary systems are formed in the first place. Um, my my uh, personal scientific motivation in my research is to better understand how our solar system formed uh, and evolved over time by studying the surfaces of asteroids and also the moon. Um, asteroids in particular are really good about, uh, are really useful for helping us understand how the solar system formed because uh, they've been uh, essentially unchanged since the very, very beginning of, uh, of the solar system. Uh, so they're uh, this kind of record of how things were early on. Um, and then I seek to apply this understanding of the solar system to support uh, exploration of the solar system, whether robotic exploration or human exploration. And I go about this a few ways. I go about my science a few ways. So, um, you know, science can look a lot of different ways. So uh, some of the science I do is observational. Um, so that's using telescopes to, uh, to observe uh, interesting things in space. You know, maybe there's a, an asteroid that has um, some particular scientific value and we want to understand it better. So I'll look at it with a telescope and get some data on it. Um, I've also done some theoretical science, so that's, uh, you know, using computer code to um, essentially simulate processes that happen in the physical world and, and understand them better that way. And I've also done experimental science, which is how I was led to the Exolith Lab, so that's me in the, in the center there. This, this is a, a picture from some experiments I did at Johnson Space Center. Um, but I've done some experimental work studying analog materials, so meaning studying materials from Earth that are uh, similar to what we expect to see in, in other, other objects in space. So the Exolith Lab, where I work now as the science lead, is part of the Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Science, which is at UCF. This is a, a center supported uh, by NASA through a program they have called SURVEY. So it's a, it's a really big group of, of uh, researchers in planetary science at UCF, so we're part of that. And the goal of the Exolith Lab is to make and uh, develop and provide to the community high fidelity regolith simulants. So what do those words mean? <laughs> so regolith is the loose dusty layer on the surface of an object like Earth or Mars or the Moon or asteroids that sits above bedrock. So on Earth, this is just what we call soil, right? If you know, in most places on Earth, if you go outside and you look at the ground, it's not just, you know, hard bedrock, right? There's loose soil on top. And that's the same case on the Moon. You know, it's, it looks a little different on the Moon and on asteroids than it does on Earth, but it's essentially just ground up rocks that make um, this very fine uh, bed of particles. So, and simulants are, you know, fake regolith, essentially, Earth materials that are standing in for regolith found on the Moon, Mars, and asteroids. So that's what we mean by simulants. And then high fidelity means, um, you know, we try to get these things as close as we can to the real thing in terms of the minerals that are, are used, the chemistry of those minerals, and the shapes and sizes of the particles at, at the teeny tiny level. So there's um, some of our <laughs> bags of, of regolith simulant on the shelf. So why 
why why am I doing this? Why are we doing this? Well, it's really, really hard and expensive to get uh, actual regolith from the moon or Mars or asteroids, right? You have to send a spacecraft there or people. And, you know, of course, we've done this. For example, we have samples from the moon, right? We had, uh, you know, NASA sent sent many crewed missions to the moon in the Apollo program, and we have samples, um, but, you know, they're very, very hard to get, and they're very precious, and there's not a lot of them. So there are a lot of reasons you would need to play with regolith or something close to it that, you know, you couldn't justify using those precious samples, or you'd need a huge amount. So there are a lot of scientific studies where, you know, maybe the, the study is destructive, right? You're going to destroy the the, the regolith in your study. So simulants are great for that because, you know, they're cheap. So <laughs> destroy away. We use them uh, in, in, in education as well. So there's, through many programs, we have K-12 students who are working with simulants, for example, to grow plants, practice, you know, to see whether plants can grow in simulant. But probably the, the biggest thing that simulants are used for just in terms of, you know, who is getting the most simulant from us are those who are working on developing space technologies. So people, for example, who want to test, you know, maybe they're making a component of a landed spacecraft, you know, like a rover, and they want to test the rover wheels or the joints on that landed spacecraft or a seal or something and see how well those things hold up against the regolith or, you know, is the wheel going to turn in the regolith? So you want to test that before you're there. So, you know, you might then want to get a big bed of regolith simulant and test your rover wheel, for example, there. Um, this, the next point kind of ties in uh, closely to uh, Dr. Temi's talk. So, um, you know, it's really hard to bring all the stuff that you need to have a long-term human presence in space from Earth, right? Because you have to launch it off the surface of the Earth and it's heavy. <laughs> so, you know, we want to use as much stuff as we can that's already there on the moon or Mars, for example. You know, you could build habitats out of regolith or you could extract oxygen or water from regolith to support human life. And so, um, simulant, people use simulants, regolith simulants, to, you know, test those technologies. Um, and then um, this is kind of what the picture that I have here is illustrating that dust on the moon in particular is a really big problem. The lunar regolith is very, very, it's like a powder. Like if you think of cornstarch or, or baby powder, it's that kind of a texture and it, or, or even finer. And it just gets dust everywhere. Um, and it was a big problem uh, in the Apollo era, and it's a health problem. So it's not good to inhale it. So um, preventing damage to equipment and also preventing uh, harms to human health from dust is a big problem for uh, having people uh, on the surface of the moon. And so people want to test systems to deal with that using simulant. So that's why, that's, why, that's the motivation for having simulant. So then how do we make it? Well, um, we start by having a, a reference material. So, you know, a, a regolith is really just, it's essentially just ground up rocks. It's, it's the stuff that was the rocks that these things are made out of. You know, the moon is essentially a big rock. Asteroids are big rocks. <laughs> um, and the surface, it gets ground up by things like, uh, well, on the moon and asteroids, the surface is ground up by, by impacts of, of meteorites over billions of years. Mars, there's also other processes. There was probably water in the past. There's wind. So there's several processes on Mars. But anyway, it's just ground up rocks. So we want to know what those rocks are. What are the minerals in those rocks so that we can match those minerals with earth rocks? So we, we pick a reference material. So, um, you know, for the moon, we have samples that were collected by astronauts. So that's, those make great references. Um, there's lots of notes about where those samples came from, et cetera. Mars, you know, we have, there are a couple of uh, meteorites from Mars, so pieces of Mars that broke off and landed on Earth. Um, but we actually have better, better data than that because we have uh, laboratories all over Mars, and those are our Mars rovers. So the rovers have studied various sites on Mars, and that tells us about those minerals. Uh, and then asteroids, we have meteorites again, those are pieces of asteroids. And now we're starting to get samples collected by spacecraft. And we have data from telescopes as well. So, so basically we figure out what are the minerals that are on these, um, on these objects. And then, you know, let's go out there and find some earth rocks that are, that are close. Um, a couple of considerations though, 
um, you know, earth processes are very different um, from these other objects I'm talking about. You know, earth is very different from the moon or Mars or asteroids. We have abundant flowing water. We have an oxygen atmosphere. We have volcanoes. We have plate tectonics. And those processes change the chemistry of, of rocks and minerals. And so, you know, we have to be very careful that we're using earth rocks that are as reasonably close as they can be to the thing we're trying to mimic. And we also have to make sure that we can get these, these rocks consistently in large quantities. So, you know, having one really great rock is not going to be helpful when we want, you know, somebody wants 10,000 kilograms of simulant, right? We need truckloads of really good rocks. So, <laughs> um, so that goes into the, the process. So we find the rocks and then we crush them and turn them into a, a powder, essentially. So this is um, just a visual uh, representation of the process. Um, we start with rocks and, uh, and I take no credit for this part. We have a simulant team, primarily UCF students, uh, although not entirely. Um, and this is not their only function at Exolith, but one of their very important functions is they take rocks and there we have a series of rock crushers that crush the rocks uh, finer and finer. And then we use uh, sieves. You could think of it like a strainer to strain out the big pieces. And we end up with, you know, you start with, with some big, big rocks, you end up with uh, this very fine, fine dirt. This is, this is the final thing I'm going to mention is just, uh, so what do I do <laughs> at the lab? Um, if I'm not, if I'm not out there with these hardworking folks crushing rocks, what do I do? Well, I, I do several things. So one important role I have is analyzing rock and mineral composition. So, you know, I was mentioning that you know, we have to be really careful to make sure that the chemistry of the rocks that we're using is appropriate. So um, when we need to find a new source for a rock um, to put in a simulant, um, I will take that and analyze it using um, some of these analytical techniques that I've mentioned here, x-ray diffraction and fluorescence spectroscopy. You know, we take them into the lab, you get some, you get some charts that look like these squiggly lines here, and those squiggly lines actually tell you a lot about what's happening at the at the molecular level inside the uh, inside the minerals. So I do uh, I do a lot of that. Um, I also do uh, a lot of characterizing and evaluating our simulants. You know, we want to know how well do these simulants actually mimic the real regolith? And in what ways don't they? You know, there there are no perfect simulants. You know, there's nothing there's nothing like the real thing. So we want to make sure we know um, so that we can, you know, help inform people who want to use our simulants. Yeah, they're really good for this purpose, but maybe not so good for this other purpose. Um, and that leads into something else that's a big part of my role at Exolith, which is to help researchers and engineers incorporate simulants into their projects, you know, make sure they're using the right kind of simulant, um, you know, making sure it's going to do what they need it to do for their project. Um, and sometimes that involves coming up with a custom simulant. You know, sometimes what we have on the shelf just isn't, uh, isn't right for somebody, but we can, you know, we can make, <laughs> we can make a custom one. So we do that. Um, and then one of the best parts of my, of my role at Exolith is getting to work with a number of students at UCF, um, undergraduate and graduate students. There are, here's, here's our team. Uh, and many of these folks are students and, um, they're involved in in all aspects of of exolith from like i said crushing rocks to research and the business aspect of of the lab um you know working with with customers um so you know getting to work on research with students and um you know guiding them on their independent research is one of the uh one of the most fun parts of of uh, my job at exolith so I will uh, leave it there. And thank you so much for, for listening. Um, thank you so much. That was fascinating. It was one of the things actually I was very much wondering when I was looking through the Exolith Lab website, which was kind of like, how do you ensure that the chemistry is right? Um, so I'm really excited to hear about that. And I also want to announce that I'm actually giving away a, a very small, uh, regular uh, simulant sample uh, to one of the participants uh, here today, um, and we'll announce that at the beginning of our Q&A. So thank you, Dr. Lansman, for working with me on that. Um, and with that, we'll just go right into uh, Dr. Nabidi. 
Hi there, thank you, Kim. Well, my presentation talk will be on keeping people alive and healthy in space um, with based on some of the work that's ongoing here at the University of Colorado. And yes, I am Associate Professor James Navity. Go to the next screen. So just a little bit of background about me. From central Nebraska originally, I uh, got a master's degree during on fellowship while I worked at the Naval Air Warfare Center. It's now a Naval Air Warfare Station. Uh, they've changed their names a number of times. And at that point I was working on propulsion, but it got me involved with chemically reacting systems, which ultimately got me back to my love for human space flight, uh, which I became involved with when I went to industry for several years, uh, working in small business. And then I've been at the University of Colorado for about the last eight plus years. We have a number of research thrusts at CU Boulder with focus on spacecraft and habitat design, astronaut health, and this is really part of my effort in terms of keeping the crew alive and space life sciences. And all of these fill, or basically flow into the field of bioastronautics, which is a study and support of life in space. So what are some of the challenges associated with long duration human space life? Well, one is habitat design, actually building a spacecraft or a habitat that can prov make provision for all of the needs of the crew. And there are a number of ways to do that. One is leveraging in situ resources, I love that talk on Regolith that we just heard from Zoe because I use and my students utilize some of the simulants in order to explore the feasibility for extracting metals or oxygen from Regolith, using that as a soil media or a soil substrate for the growth of plants. We look at, in particular, regenerable uh, environmental control and life support systems, as it's called. And we're concerned with protection from the radiation environment and how to sustain crew members when they're on EVAs, uh, extravehicular activities. So I have a number of students, uh, both past and present, who are working some of these areas. And if, if you look at this, you'll see a diverse set of research activities that are either ongoing or have been happening. And one of our current focuses is really on the robustness of technologies. As most of us are probably aware, most of you are probably aware, International Space Station has certainly been a proving ground for environmental control life support. And there have been a number of challenges that have been faced, particularly with CO2 removal and with water treatment, water recovery and treatment on board Space Station. So when we think about you know, the hazards of space to life and health, Vacuum obviously is one of those problems. And if we think about other atmospheres, for example, the Mars atmosphere, which has uh, roughly 95% carbon dioxide, a percent carbon monoxide, a little bit of nitrogen and uh, oxygen, argon. But these environments are hazardous to people living in these environments, temperature extremes. Uh, the lunar surface, for example, from minus 250 Fahrenheit to plus 250 Fahrenheit. Uh, the damage or ch challenge with micrometeoroids um, in low Earth orbit were additionally faced with the objects, other objects that are in low Earth orbit that pose a crew. So orbital debris, uh, weightlessness, and gravity fields. And of course, if we talk about transit to either lunar or Mars, environments, there is a period of weightlessness before transitioning to these reduced gravity environments. And then of course, space radiation. So what is the importance overall for ECLOS to support habitability of people in space? Well, we think about it in terms of a timeline, and I illustrate this from left to right in terms of the influence from seconds to months to years as we go across, and I start with the loss of a breathable atmosphere because that is the thing that would potentially cause loss of life in space immediately. And just to give some influence, loss of a breathable atmosphere can result in loss of consciousness in seconds, loss of life in minutes. And this comes from a wonderful resource called the Bioastronautics Data Book. And then as we go down that list, there's the influence of toxic, toxic gases, such as metabolic carbon dioxide. If an individual were enclosed in a room 
and naturally breathing and respiring, uh, the respiration of CO2 will build up to the point where it could cause a toxic environment before loss of oxygen. And so it's just something to be aware of. Extreme temperatures again. And it just depends on the environment as to how quickly that will potentially be a problem. Lack of water and food. Um, we're all aware of scenarios where people have been able to survive without water for three to seven days, food eight plus days, uh, depending on the conditions that they're in. But these two are problems. And other hazards such as radiation, the, the risk of injury, the treatment, fire on board space stations or space habitats is particularly problematic, problematic because of the influence that it'll have on the surrounding atmosphere uh, because of smoke and uh, contaminants that are produced, the toxic gases. And we're in this confined space, so it's not like we can just open the window and escape. So this leads to a number of design drivers when thinking about environmental control export systems, and they depend on the mission objectives. NASA has been focused on a number of these. When we think about commercial space flight, this environment particularly could expand even more. When we think about in the last year, we've had the youngest crew member go into space, the oldest crew member go into space to date. And that's occurred on commercial vehicles. So destination matters, the diversity that's associated with the makeup of the crew, those humans that are going into space, whether they be tourists or professionals, and ultimately that influences things like the space habitat design, the level of robustness for the technology that has to be implemented, human factors considerations, because associated with this diversity in the, the uh, range of humans that are being now flown into space, they may have special considerations that are required for either physiological health or psychological health. So meeting these challenges really entails, first, we wanna keep the crew alive. We wanna keep these people alive as they go into this new environment, the space environment, and preferably keep them healthy, happy, and productive, which translates ultimately to robust vehicle and life support system design, as well as some biomedical countermeasures for human factors and a number of operational concepts. And when we think about commercial vehicles, bringing these pay, perhaps paying customers into the environment of space, the risk that's associated with this activity is something that must be conveyed as well. So when we think about the human subsystem and what that might mean, I've outlined it here in terms of inputs and outputs. Some of the key metabolic outputs for the crew would be oxygen, water, and food. And then I illustrate nitrogen in terms of maintaining a comfortable pressure. You know, we think about our atmosphere pressure, it's mostly sea level static, perhaps to some range of altitude. And the question for our uh, spacecraft designers for, for space habitats for people is what environment to establish? And of course that depends partly on the mission, what activities are being planned. The outputs are simplified here, but carbon dioxide is certainly one of the common ones that's important to consider, and we must remove. Respired and perspired water, we want to recover that as and treat it for potable water. The same with urine, recovering the water from that and then treating the brine for storage. Perspired solid species, and then ultimately, of course, metabolic heat. Most space habitats are designed to be essentially like thermos bottles, where the crew member is, and along with other equipment, heat producing equipment, is enclosed in this insulated environment. And so that heat has to be uh, eliminated in order to prevent overheat of the crew members. And then when we look at some of these requirements in a little more detail and what I encourage is just focus on the oxygen, the very top one in terms of a reference crew member needs approximately 0.8 kilograms of oxygen per day. And the respired output from that in terms of carbon dioxide is about one kilogram per crew member per day on average. 
Well, again, when we talk about the range of human physiologies that might be transported into space, and just to illustrate it, this is a fifth percentile female, it has on the order of a need of about 0.6 kilograms, produces roughly 0.8 kilograms of CO2 per day. And if we look at the 95th percentile male, needing on the order of one kilogram per day of oxygen, producing almost 1.3 kilograms per day of CO2. And this is NASA's type of numbers. When we think about commercial vehicles, the range of parameters that a life support system might have to treat goes even beyond these limits. We're talking greater deltas. And so there are some significant challenges that are posed ultimately in terms of the environmental control life support system for space. So what are some of the key functions that must be provided? Well, we've already seen atmosphere, water, and food. But in addition to that, there's this need for waste management, particularly for crew safety, which includes the fire detection and safety, but also radiation protection, medical facilities in order to treat not only injuries, but just conditions that might arise in human spaceflight. Uh, but atmosphere is key, and that's why you see this long list of parameters that are necessary in order to maintain a breathable atmosphere in the space environment. Not only provide oxygen and remove carbon dioxide, but we almost also filter out particulates and microorganisms. Remove volatile organics that are, again, toxic contaminants that could impair the crew. Monitor and control the partial pressures of all these. So the composition, overall makeup of the gas and maintain that total cabin pressure. Keep the temperature and humidity at a very comfortable level. So roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 40% relative humidity uh, for the comfort of the crew. Think of shirt sleeve environment is what we're trying to maintain. And then because in a microgravity environment, there's no natural convection available to uh, distribute or help um, maintain a breathable atmosphere throughout the cabin, it must be some forced convection. So fans are required in order to, to do that, particularly between modules. So some of the considerations for human factors associated with environmental control life support, physiological factors, as you've just seen from the prior diagrams, sex, weight, and age can all influence those. Then there are other factors that could be important in terms of the, how exciting is the, uh, the event? And that things like vibration, lighting, noise, and ecosystems, systems, particularly these fans that are required to treat and revitalize that atmosphere, they tend to be noisy. So that influences then how we deal with crew accommodations, ergonomics, and ultimately what that might lead to in terms of crew behavior and interactions. Uh, during the environment that they're part of. And then do we need exercise facilities? Um, do we need to support other crew activities, social activities that might be required? So this is all influencing habitat design, which ultimately then influences the need for ECLOS. So I just wanna wrap up with this diagram, and this is a illustration of schematic of how it's done on the International Space Station. But I show this to really illustrate the complexity and the interactions that are associated with an environmental control life support system. So if we look at this, we have the crew in the center. Um, and let's just kind of start top and move around circling to the right. So we have this temperature and humidity control that's influencing or part of the atmosphere revitalization system, this quadrant to the right, where we have air provision for CO2 removal, trace contaminant removal that removes those volatile organics that I just talked about, also removes particulates. One of the things that's been investigated to reduce the need for consumables. So resupply from Earth back to Space Station is a Sabatier system, which is chemically uh, 
reacts to carbon dioxide with hydrogen to produce methane and recover oxygen in the form of water. That water can go to a water processing plant, which basically can then be traded for uh, either producing potable water, drinking water for the crew, or via electrolysis produce oxygen. Obviously waste management. Onboard space station solids are, are basically packaged into what are called these footballs. Essentially the trash is packed in a garbage bag, Ziploc type bag, that's sealed and then duct tape in order to store it until it can be returned to earth or uh, burned up in with a progress vehicle. Uh, feces are stored separately and they are chemically treated and safened. Urine, as I've mentioned, water is recovered from and the brine is stored separately again, treated to safen it from biological contamination. So there's a very fairly complex integrated and highly interactive system with the crew at the center. And then most of my research has been focused on this area of atmosphere revitalization, given the challenge that it poses for keeping the crew alive. And with that, I say thank you and I'll take questions later. Awesome, yeah. thank you so much for sharing. Um, so one question we have here is, um, I guess this is probably for Zoe, uh, how does nutrient density work in non-Earth soil types? Um, and like, I guess, how does that, how would that impact the nutrients in those plants? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, that's, uh, that's a very good point, right? There, uh, earth soil has nutrients because there are biological processes adding nutrients to the soil. There's plants decaying and animal matter decaying and, uh, bacteria that are processing the soil. So, right, so we have nutrients in earth soil because of biology. So how does that work if you're, uh, you know, on a, on a lifeless rock? Well, it's a problem. There are very few nutrients available, um, for example, in the lunar soil. Um, there, so there are some people who are working on studying how well you can grow plants in regolith with nothing added, but generally speaking, you probably have to add some kind of nutrient uh, to that, to the regolith if you wanna use that as a medium to grow plants in. And then the question just becomes, what is the, the best nutrient that you can bring that's not uh, so bulky and heavy so that it's reasonable to bring or something that you could you know, make in an ongoing way in space, so. Thank you, I'm sure you know that there's a lot more science to be done on that area. And I said, so just general question, have uh, space station scientists developed or discovered new allergies from their unique habitat? And I guess if they have, like, what do you do? Yo, know, the only one I can think of that I'm aware of is from the Apollo days with respect to the dust that got into the lunar module um, via the spacesuits. And uh, I know some of the crew members experienced uh, respiratory problems due to the dust. They weren't long-term, and so it wasn't sustained, you know, throughout the rest of their life, but they certainly had immediate issues, respiratory-related issues due to the dust. Um, and I guess if, imagining that we, you know, we somehow ran into um, an allergen, I, I, is there a way that we uh, could then I figure out what to do about it? I don't know the answer to that one. That's fine. I'm, you have some really phenomenal questions, so I figure I'll just toss them out there. Have any advances in solar energy provided useful in, or to, in order to provide fuel for spacecraft? Yeah, so, I mean, solar energy is, has been uh, a really great thing that is applied all over in terms of the spacecraft, right? Uh, one of the things that your constraints up there, right, is again, the, the kind of the weight. And so depending on where you're at, you could certainly optimize the chemistry of the solar cell. So, you know, initially we made the solar cells with what we could manufacture, but uh, there's been a lot of discussion and research in terms of should we tune it to say, you know, the composition of the atmosphere uh, would be a different, what, what light makes it through the atmosphere, depending on what planet you're trying to, to visit versus something like the moon where there is no atmosphere. So the spectrum of light, uh, you can start doing some things. And, uh, you know, currently, you know, like what's going on in your houses across the country 
that's more of a what you can you cost is your primary driver there rather than the ultimate efficiency. But when we go to space, you know, those extra gains and percentage points in the energy um, start to change that cost benefit analysis. Awesome, thank you. And then kind of this is in a similar vein. Have you observed any components of regolith that might be particularly useful for creating rocket propulsion systems? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the components that are important are, you know, for one thing, there's, there's a lot of oxygen. I mean, we don't think of there being oxygen on the moon, for example, uh, and there's not oxygen like there is in our atmosphere, but, but, but the minerals are actually mostly made of oxygen at the molecular level. So um, there are lots of people working on ways to extract oxygen to use it as, as rocket fuel. Um, you know, how do you get that oxygen out of the minerals? Um, and there are also metals in the minerals too. There's aluminum and iron. And so there are uh, a number of uh, processes that you can uh, extract the metals, uh, you know, when you're talking about actually building, building stuff, that's, you know, extracting the metals is probably the most important thing there. I was thinking, I don't know if Dr. Tony, if you had anything you wanted to add. You would probably um, start making solid rocket motors with like the, the different metal groups there. there. There is some work in terms of like additivizing that into the liquid sur surrey, but certainly anywhere. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Nabity said was um, we have all this CO2 people are breathing out, right? So if we can start building methane, um, that's another way. And then you've got extra oxygen from the regolith or from um, when we talk about maybe going to Mars, right? Pulling uh, methane from the atmosphere there is certainly a way to harvest your fuel from wherever it is that you landed. Awesome, thank you. I think this might be applicable to every, anyone, everyone. So I'm gonna make it a little bit broader maybe. Is it possible to predict the atmosphere on deep space objects sort of like do we haven't been there? Now, what do we do with that information? This question particularly asks about uh, constructing stimulants. So you can, uh, you know, if you're talking about um, for example, exoplanets. So those are planets that are around other stars, um, you know, other planetary systems. It is possible to predict what those atmospheres are like. Um, and you can do that. Uh, this is actually one of the things that the James Webb Space Telescope is, is going to be amazing for. So you can do that with telescopes. And what you do is you watch, you, you watch the star, you know, so you know that there's a planetary system around some star and you point your telescope at the star and if the planetary system is aligned just right, the planet from your point of view will sometimes go in front of the star. You, know, you can imagine if you're looking, don't ever look toward the sun, but if you're looking toward the sun at the right times, there could, there's what we call a transit. So you can see Venus or Mercury from our perspective on earth, right? You can see Venus or Mercury pass in front of the sun. So we're doing that, but we can do that with a telescope looking uh, far off at other stars. So you watch the planet go in front of the star, and then you, you, you see the star dims a little because the planet is blocking a little bit of that light. And when that dimming happens, the light from the star is passing through a little bit of that planet's atmosphere. And depending on what that atmosphere is made of, um, the atmosphere of the star will dim more or less at certain wavelengths. So you can, you can make a model and figure out what gases are in that atmosphere. Um, so yeah, this is going to be one of the huge things that James Webb, I mean, we've, we've been able to, not me personally, but colleagues of mine have been able to do this with, uh, with um, other infrared telescopes like the Spitzer Space Telescope, but James Webb is going to be tremendous for this. Um, and I, I don't see why you couldn't con construct, you know, like a, have, a, I'm sure somebody has done this. Um, I don't personally do this, but I don't see why you couldn't have a cell in a laboratory where you uh, mix those gases that you've measured, you know, you've modeled that they're in this atmosphere. You could make sort of a box of, uh, of atmosphere in a lab. You could, you could definitely do that. Awesome. Thank you. Um... Well, you guys have some really, really phenomenal questions. Um, so I'm going to ask one. More, I'm going to ask one more from this, and then I have a final question for all of the uh, our presenters today. Dr. Nabidi, what are some of the psychological challenges uh, that humans would have in terms of living in space? Yeah, that's an awesome question, and if, I'm going to take risk sharing screen just to illustrate. 
I, I had it as a kind of backup slide. And this is one of my favorite examples of exactly this challenge. Uh, this was at the end of the uh, 19th century, actually, where the Belgica exploring Antarctica was investigating, you know, that continent for the first time. And they got trapped in ice. They got landlocked or ice locked and could not get out. And it, and it happened because they arrived late in the season. So they arrived like February in Antarctica and coupled with an early winter, they were trapped. And so there were 18 men on the verge of physical and psychological collapse in this incredibly extreme challenging environment. Well, fortunately, Dr. Cook, a recent addition to the crew, came up with some factors to help mitigate. And as a result, the crew survived. Um, what did he do? Well, one hour in front of a camp stove for each crew member every day. Exercise, fresh meat. So they hunted for seals in order to provide fresh meat. And it turns out fresh meat actually contains vitamin C, which helped to offset the risk of scurvy. So it's a challenging environment, a daunting environment. Overcoming this is non-trivial. Ultimately, what does this mean for commercial space flight? How long are the people going wherever they're going? You know, most of us can tolerate a lot for hours or for days. Can we tolerate, tolerate it for weeks or months? And that's, it's a great question. Not everybody will be able to tolerate it for extended periods of time. And so that's, awareness is really important. Brings up my last question, because that made me think about Star Trek and how the science research specials don't have um, holodecks. Yeah, because, you know, you need to have entertainment, right? So my last question to each one of you, um, as I thank everyone for joining us, and I, you know, thank the sponsors on the screen. Um, give me your best estimate to how long it's going to take us to get to Star Trek. I'll take a quick cut of part of it. Uh, virtual reality, augmented reality is, even though I'm not a video gamer, uh, it's clear we're on the verge of some pretty exciting things in a three-dimensional arena. So probably fairly close to the holodeck um, in terms of maybe, you know, within the next generation or so. That's my thoughts. Awesome. I don't have a good quantitative answer for you, but I, I guess I would just say, I think it'll be sooner than we can imagine because uh, technology tends to grow exponentially, you know, so it's, it's uh, you know, we kind of think of it linearly like, oh, well, in, you know, 10 years, it's going to be whatever. It's going to, it's going to grow at the same rate every year that it's been growing, but technology grows, um, you know, exponentially. So I think it's going to surprise us how, how soon it happens. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say an exact date. I, I would echo that comment that um, there's a lot of things that are, are happening right now that are closer than we think. I would love to see the teleporter, but um, some of those by science fiction um, or faster than light drives. But uh, certainly, I think we're going to see, hopefully in the next generation or so, a lot of advances here. Awesome. Thank you for those answers. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Mm -hmm.